some money out. So we're really hoping that this is going to be of value to you. We've had excellent questions come in and questions that pertain not only to our school but Taekwondo in general that I think will be of interest to everybody tonight. Um, I'd like to start off with some very basic questions that came in. And I think it would be um, a benef benefit, uh, Addison Heard. Glad to hear the young ones yep, he sent an email in and wanted to know what Kwan do we belong to? Uh, we belong to the Muda Kwan. Uh, the Muda Kwan is uh, one of the five primordial Kwans, uh, and the uh, meaning is the Institute of Martial Virtue. And uh, the founder of that particular Kwan, so you have to understand something the word Kwan. The way we spell it in the West is K-W-A-N. Many of you know that. But if you look at the term Taekwondo, uh, the word is sounds the same, but it's K-W-O-N, right? And the difference is that uh, Taekwondo uh, Kwan is fist, okay? the way of, of uh, the fist, fourth fist way. The Kwan in uh, Muda Kwan or Chung Kwan or one of the institutes is just that. It means institute or place of learning. So it's not Muda K W O N, but Muda K W A N, and it was founded by Grandmaster Wang Ki. Right? And uh, his heritage was quite different from those of the other Kwan founders in that he never really directly studied karate with Gichi uh, Funakochi or one of the Toyamas or one of the other masters who were in Japan during the occupation. Uh, he claims that he studied karate from a book, but he did get extensive training in some of the Chinese martial arts when he was employed by the uh, Manchurian Railroad uh, during the occupation. So our Kwan is fairly unique and there's quite a history to it, an interesting history. So we have discussed in other sessions that a lot of the art came from Okinawan, Okinawa and from Japan and some from China. Was there a specificity of the Kwans, the five Kwans, that some came from China, some had more influence from Japan, others from Okinawa, or is it sort of just absorbed in? Mm, that's a really The original names of the Kwans were not necessarily um, the way they appear to most people these days. Uh, another one, in other words, there was uh, a Chosun Yuma Kwan, Kwan Bapu, for instance, right? And some of these Kwans really emphasized judo in their training, you know, because it was allowed in Korea during the occupation, uh, that in Kendo, right, the sword way. Uh, but for the most part, uh, um, you know, they weren't considered grandmasters at the time, but uh, Wan Kuk Lee, uh, by the way, everybody, I just want to um, make sure you understand, when I use the terms of Korean names, I used it in the Western sense. I put the last name at the end. Uh, most historians will take and do it the correct way, which would be the Korean way, putting the last name first. Uh, but I do it the opposite way, just out of convenience for my students. So when I talk about uh, Wan Kuk Lee, who was the founder of the Chung Duk Wan, or Byung Jik Ro, or um, uh, when I talk about uh, Sang Sip Chun, or if I speak about uh, Wang Ki, their name is always on the last. But almost all of them practice uh, karate in, in Japan. So. It's not so much did the masters themselves emphasize a Chinese style or an Okinawan style. Uh, 
to be accurate, and, and we are these days. In the 21st century, we finally got our history together, I think, pretty much, when we describe Taekwondo and its roots, is that you don't much, you can't so much follow what the Kwans were doing. You have to follow more the lineage of where the art traveled. You know? And most people agree that it had its fountainhead in China. You know, that's where really most of the martial arts came from. And then they found their way to Okinawa. So Okinawa studied tote. Right? It wasn't karate. A lot of people think, oh, that's where it came from. Well, yeah, it came from there, but the term was tote. Right? And um, one of the uh, two major uh, teachers, at, at least in the late 19th century, were Anko Watosu and Anko uh, Zadu. You know? and, and Gichin Funakochi, who is boy at that time, practice with them. And then, uh, this, there's a lot to the history, but to make a long story short, he wound up going to Japan by invitation of the educational department there to teach what then became karate in, uh, in 1922. And, you know, I also like to teach my students to use the right phrasing when we talk about these things. So when we talk about the, the uh, martial art, I prefer you not to use the word karate. You know, everybody's going to do that. That's the most common phrase. The right way to pronounce it is roll the R. You say karate. Right? So karate, karate. was uh, promulgated by uh, Kitchen Funakochi in, um, in 1922 in, in, uh, in Japan. And so, uh, again, just reiterating what we've said over the last several classes, is that um, the... the uh, People who lived in Korea who were studying martial arts couldn't get a good education in Korea, right? They was only second rate because of the devastation of the occupation, Japanese occupation. You all know the years were 1910 to 1945 at that point. But, um, so they had to attend university in, in uh, Japan. And while in Japan, while studying in, in university, they decided to study karate. So they would study the Funakochi most of the time. And there were several other masters too who they would study with, but uh, who had even more Chinese influence. But uh, most of them have their roots then in Okinawa and Karate. Interesting. I love when we branch into this. Is, is there a translation that you're aware of of Tote? Well, no, not actually, but that's the, because it never really migrated from Okinawa. Ah. So So, you said that we're the Muda, we, we belong to the lineage of Mudaquan, which is the Institute of Martial Virtue. Correct. And we know that there are two international organizations. There's the World Taekwondo Federation, the WTF, and there's the ITF, the International Taekwondo Federation. Was, did certain Kwans divide out that way, or how did that evolve? Um, well, that's a long story. Uh, so you had the original five Kwans, first of all, and each of them, just like uh, we have five different students, say. You know, well, you're a master, let's say Master Crouch, Master uh, Roche, Master Testa, right? You do all the side to start your own schools. And you, the reason you did it is because you had a certain proclivity for teaching martial arts a certain way, you know, that would maybe be different from that, you know. So each Kwan had its own personality, for sure. Some were more, much more aggressive, especially when it came to sparring, right? Which sparring was looked down, you know, it really wasn't done very much in the original Kwan. And in fact, in Chunga Kwan, it did contact
are very proud to call ourselves part of the Kuki One because the forms that the Kuki One establish are important to us, because the training they establish is important to us. Some of the little details and things that they're changing now, we don't necessarily adhere to. But one thing we do not do is entirely support the World Taekwondo Association uh, organization. And that's because we don't really do sports barring or sports barring. I notice you're wearing your Kuki One. Yes, do yeah, so, I do. And I, I almost wore my, my Dobak from Korea today. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of that Dobak. Um, is there a translation, per se, of the Kuki One, or is that just what it's called? No, Kuki One typically means national gymnasium. You know, right. Or um, the word Wan is an elevation of Kwan. Taekwondo Wan, Kuki Wan, W-O-N, is more of a, a larger a wider. Kind of university connotation. Fascinating. Kukiwan means national. Like when we say bow to the flag, Kuki Kunye. Right. So Kuki is national. Right? So Kukiwan would be the national gymnasium or the national center for training. Got it. Fascinating. So that leads right into a question we have from instructor Patty Laurie. And Master. Master, yes. Master, Master Patty Laurie, yes. That's right now. And she said. The Palge and Yudanja forms were developed in the 60s. By whom and where? Uh, it was developed by the KTA, first of all, because you've got to understand the Kuki One wasn't around, right? And there was a committee of uh, masters from the various Kwans that established that. And I believe the Mudakwan was not in attendance at that first conference, which is one of the reasons why they got together because they don't want any representation. If you want the individual names, you can uh, use this book as a reference. It lists, and this book too, the other the, on uh, Corio, lists all the members of the committees for the various uh, Pumse organizations. You know. But it was done by committee. Mm -hmm. uh, the interesting thing that I can tell you right now is in discussions with uh, Grandmaster uh, Johan Lee while he was here, I was very fascinated by his discussion because he talked about new forms. Right. You cannot be over emphatic when you talk about the sacred nature of Pumse. Right? Pumse is our Bible. You know, it's our catalog to take one go, right? This is one of the reasons why forms are not just created haphazardly and thrown into the mix. Uh, last time forms were created were fairly recently probably within the last five or six years, ten years, and that's the new competition forms that are being used uh, in the Olympics, right? Or not, I'm sorry, not in the Olympics, but in the World Championships. Uh, uh, forms aren't done in the Olympics yet. But um, uh, these forms range from things like peacock all the way up to hanru and, and, and nare, and they're age-specific. But these forms made an entrance after much dispute and much controversy. There weren't just someone walked in and said, I have a new form, do you like it? It had to go through committee after committee after committee. And uh, Grandmaster Lee told me, he goes, no form is OK without my old. Because <laughs> he has been He's... around in the Kuki one longer than <clears throat> most people. You know, now there's another new president of the Kuki one. You know, there's been president after president, vice president after vice president. But uh, Grandmaster uh, Johan Lee remains steadfast, marching down the aisles of the Kuki Wine decade after decade. And he's a very high-ranking individual there. And pretty much he, I have to take his word for it, well, his the forms are not allowed unless he pretty much gives the okay to it, right? So um, uh, the Palge and the Tegu forms, I'm sorry, the Palge forms and the Udanja forms were originally created to answer your question by KTA, by committee. And then in 72, when the table forms were established, it was a lot of the men gentlemen with the same committee, but with some additions as well. Right? But uh, it, it would be like opening up the Koran or opening up uh, the Bible or the Torah and, and finding someone had just written a new chapter in it. 
early. It's just not done. Right. You know, and that's the way it is with forms. We get people coming in all the time saying, I'm going to create my own form, right? That happens in composition. People create their own forms in composition. That's done. It's called creative form set, right? But that doesn't mean that it has the stamp of approval or the sanction of the governing bodies, right? What we practice are traditional forms there for a reason. And even though in the past I had classes <clears throat> where I would do make up a form set, I would go to Grandmaster Chun and I'd say, sir, I got this great thing. And he'd look at me like, what are you doing? You know, that's, you can't do that, you know? So I was put in line. I have students to this day who want to do things like that. And I have to tell them, you know, nicely, it's not done. You know, it's simply not done. Even in it's not done. Huh. That's, that's interesting. So that brings up two questions to me. One, Will forms be in the Olympics soon? Are they still pushing for it? The answer is, is there going to be an Olympics? Well, the yes. First of all, we know, number one, the 2020 Olympics have been canceled. Correct. So next, I just read recently, they were even thinking ahead to the next one, is there going to be one? And they're saying maybe not. Really? So we don't know what's going to happen right now. But to the answer your question, taking ourselves back several months, uh, forms were not going to be in the 2020 Olympics. Um, a lot can happen now going forward until the next Olympics that the Taekwondo will be in. The question is, is if will Taekwondo even be in those Olympics because it's going to fight every single one to, to maintain it. And um, uh, I know that in 2020, this Olympics was hosted by, by Japan, and they used uh, kata. And so karate was going to be in it because they get a chance to pick a go demonstration sport. So they naturally <coughs> pick karate, right? Sure. And so not only were they going to do kumite, which is a sparring, but they were going to do kata as well. That would have been an eye-opener. It would have put the uh, WT into a pretty slippery position because it would just be sparring. And unless you're a Taekwondo person and you're very interested in techniques, modern sparring in the Olympics has really very little interest in me, frankly, because it's just, most people would tell you it's deteriorated the style, and it's also, um, even though they've tried to beef it up with different rules and things like this, higher score ratios, it still can be fairly boring for the average audience. I remember there was a lot of dancing around. And not, dancing. Yeah. Well, that brings me back to something you said before, that in Chung De Kwan, if you were doing sparring, and you actually hit someone, it showed you had no control, and you were asked to leave. And we've done point sparring, mm -hmm. which is probably closer to the traditional Absolutely. sparring. That's exactly right. Uh -huh. See, what we do, you wouldn't be allowed to do in the Olympics. Right. That's why I tell you, that's why I tell you and our listeners, our viewers, that the, what, the type of sparring we do is not sports sparring old style karate sparring, point sparring. It's called, I like to refer to it as the gentlemanly and womanly way of sparring, you know. Uh, when you get a point, it could stop. You know, right. The point is awarded, awarded. We're not. And a different type of uh, equipment is worn as well. You know, yes. you have the foam hands, the foam feet, the helmets, you have <clears> no <throat> hogu, you know, no forearm guards or things like that. Uh, and if you want to, and if you're a viewer of Facebook or, or just keep blogs in, in your mind, some of the attire today that's used for sparring is quite frankly absurd. I mean, it looks like a workout bar, you know, tight. Enough said there. <laughs> Great. So let me tie that into where I want to move this conversation with a little bit to the USTA. There's a lot to discuss there. And would it be counter to the mission of the USTA to sponsor point sparring tournaments in Absolutely the United States? Absolutely not. We intend to do that. You do intend Absolutely. to do that. Yeah, point sparring is the mode of sparring for the USTA. And uh, in fact, if things hadn't been the way they are right now, Grandmaster Alejandro and I would have uh, arranged the Oh, wow. And it would have been a typical <clears throat> USTA tournament, which is 
point scoring forms break? Wow. Well, that's something exciting to look forward to. Yeah, what have <laughs> Yeah, which, which I had a question here, um, which I'm looking up. I, I can tell you the question. I'm trying to, I don't know who exactly asked the question um, a few weeks back. Speaking of Master, Grand Master Alejandro, where did you meet him? Oh, I met him at Grand Master Tone School. At Master Tone School. And he's working with you with the USTA. He's one of, uh, he is our uh, technical, uh, our technical uh, director. So then let's be real specific. What is the goal of the USTA? What, what is its charter? Well, it's not so much a charter, but the mission statement is pretty much says it all, you know, which is to promote the uh, promote excellence in the traditional and evolving art. Of and, uh, where does the evolving come in? We know where the traditional comes in, right? But where does the evolving come in? Uh, a perfect example was <coughs> the World Taekwondo, uh, the, the USTA World Taekwondo Seminar we hosted last November. And thank goodness we did, you know, at that time. Uh, because we did invite Grandmaster Johan Lee uh, to come, and he did teach Nade here at the school for several days. Right. And there is a perfect example of a, an evolving entity of Taekwondo in that form itself, taken unto itself. One of the most interesting aspects of that Kung Se, if you've uh, executed it or you've practiced it with us, you know that it's not just an aerobic uh, exercise where you're jumping around and dancing and screaming he up every two seconds, you know, which a lot of this creative Kung Se is, you know. There looks to be no practical applications whatsoever, nor are they looking for it, you know. It's sort of a flash of drama. With Master Lee's Nade, if you look at it, there are so many traditional techniques, older techniques in there. Twist kicks. Right, you know, yes. Various types of elbow strikes. And, uh, it, it, it's just replete with all sorts of traditional techniques. And Master Lee would never, in my estimation, for the years that I've known him, create something as sacred as a Kung Se without denoting every practical application to each motion. So there's, there's a, that's a battle exercise. It's a long one. It's intricate. Uh, but it's also, uh, how can I put it, charitable in the sense that it is geared to an older practitioner. There's nothing in it that we can't do. It's the matter of stringing it all together and remembering. Right. It was quite intricate. Very intricate. I, I felt so blessed to, number one, be in his presence again. Absolutely. The fact that he came here to teach us. And that just opens up the question again that I, I actually have here. You know, we look at traditions that we regard as essential. And what are we willing to accept within those boundaries in an art that is evolving with forms that are being developed as we speak? How do you see that? Yeah, that's a good question, too. Uh, invariably, when we return from Korea, and even while we're there, and we've hosted a, the, our martial pilgrimages for well over 100 students at this point, you know, actually a lot more. And um, the question, I can see it on their faces. I can see their lips ready to move and ask, what do we do now? You know, because they're shown the modern styles, the modern physics of Taekwondo while we're in Korea. You can't get, you can't go anywhere and not get the best cutting edge techniques in South Korea. Right. right. So this is one of the reasons we go. We promote tradition in Taekwondo at Chosun and the USTA, and we'll always stand as a, as a, a fortress of that, right? But that would be very close-minded on my part, and also, I think, irresponsible for my students and members of the USDA. If I didn't offer them to see what's going on beyond the shores of America, right? I don't want my students or my members to have a provincial view. I want them to have a world view of the Taekwondo. So they don't go to somebody who's practicing that one and say, oh, you're wrong. Because they're not wrong, they're just different. So the, the point I'm trying to make is this, and you asked a very good question, where do the boundaries exist, right? Where, 
Americans fought in Korea to move uh, in certain ways that increase mobility, right? And many of the masters are saying that certain body body motions increase the power of the thing. Well, all I need to do is direct your attention to Grandmaster Richard Sharp and the videos he put out and his books. And if you watch him in these videos, if you don't think he has power, and if you don't think he's what's on his feet, then I beg to differ because that's the way we practice. In other words, in some of the table forms, you're doing a high block, for instance, and then now, in modern times, you bring your hands in, and we know why, and then you do your kick and your strike, right? Uh, faced with the same uh, technique, Grandmaster Chum would say, why would you stop that block? Why would you do that? If they're still attacking, you keep the block up, and then you do your kick and your punch. So that's one example of maintaining that because it was focused on self-defense and not sport or drama, right? So if someone can show us something like Nade, which is a worthwhile form, right. not considered <clears throat> one of the traditional forms, we will adopt that. Ah, that was my question. We will definitely adopt that, right? But when it comes to having a very shallow front stance and not incorporate a pre-step, when it comes to certain chambers, then it becomes my role President of USDA and as head of the Tokyo Taekwondo Academy to make a determination on what stays tradition and what doesn't. So would Nare be practiced differently in Korea than perhaps in the United States? Uh, no, not necessarily because the blueprint has been laid. You know, and not, not, not only that, but the point is this. You still have the living creator of that form alive. Yes. Right? He's living. You can yes. go right to the source and say, how did you mean this? Well, you know, many of the masters who created the Palgate forms have passed away. You know, same thing with the table forms for that matter, right? And forget about, I mean, not forget about, but think about the Chulki form, say. Think about Yumbi and all these others, you know. Uh, Kang Sung Kun. Who are you going to go to to ask what the, what the uh, applications were? You know, the unfortunate situation is this. You have to look at the fact that there's a descending order of respect when it came to martial arts. And it still kind of exists to this day in some cases, I see it. You know, the Chinese maybe didn't feel so uh, uh, charitable, to, again, I'll use that word, to the Okinawans, right? And the Okinawans didn't feel quite as charitable to the Japanese. And certainly the Japanese didn't feel charitable to the Koreans, right? So we're, we're there, and this is pretty much, pretty much common knowledge within the historical circle of Taekwondo is that where the Okinawan masters, like Funakoshi, for instance, knew the practical application, they didn't necessarily pass them on to their students. Right? So uh, the same correct. thing happened to the Japanese. Where Funakoshi may have known some of the practical applications, they didn't necessarily pass them on to the Korean masters. So when you go to a Korean master or grandmaster, like Grandmaster Chun, right, or one of the masters says, show me what the practical application is. Sometimes they would just flat out say they didn't know because they weren't shown, right? So what does that lead? Again, this vacuum where you get a plethora of people coming in, much less experienced, making up practical applications for the form and really going out outside the box where in some of the takeoff forms you see techniques and they give a practical application for it and then the technique doesn't even exist. So what did I do? Last week we talked about Occam's Razor, right? Yes. Occam's Razor from William of Ockham, you know, a long time ago, decades, right. centuries ago, yeah. who was a monk who basically said all things being equal, the simplest answer is probably the right one. Right. So I'm not trying to denigrate, uh, denigrate the techniques of Taekwondo and say they're just so mindlessly simple that, you know, we have to stick with the kick block strike formula that many people despise. But sometimes it's right, you know? Well, I don't know if I answered your question, but I <laughs> We certainly got some depth there. Um, you mentioned not everybody understood what that technique really was and the right way to execute it. And I have heard that a lot of these forms have, I'll use the term, hidden techniques. Right. Yes, Okidon, yes. And that there were ways that they adapted 
Taekwondo so that people didn't get hurt. And, and, and we kind of carry that practice on a little bit today, in my yeah. opinion. Um, but you can't just point to Taekwondo and say it was Taekwondo that did that. I agree with that, yes. And, and it, the perfect example of that, of course, is Judo. I mean, uh, Jigoro Kano was noted for taking uh, Deiru Aki Jiu Jitsu, which is one of the martial arts for samurai, you know, and literally sanitizing. So people wouldn't get broken arms, broken legs, and broken heads. Right. You know, he took all the, not, not all of them, but he took a lot of the uh, really brutal, lethal techniques out to make it something that young men can do to create more of a nationalistic spirit, which really had a big uh, influence on most make it more sports. sportive, where you did hit the ground, you didn't break a neck, but you got a point, you know. So judo was probably one of the first ones that did what we call the sanitation. You know, sanitized is the art. Um, taekwondo, uh, if you look purely at the word taekwondo, right, we come back to General Che again. And we come back to the fact that he was a, a, a general, right? So when he created the Otakwan, it was for military taekwondo. Now, what do you think the military is there to do? To take people apart at all costs, where there's little energy and effort on your part, right? So he wasn't just teaching an exercise. You know, he was teaching quick, battle-proven techniques. Now, you know, the Black Tigers during the, um, the Vietnam War. Yes. They were a Korean group that went in there and taught Taekwondo. Yes. And the <clears throat> Viet Cong were told to stay, stay away, away from, from them. these guys. Right? right. They were the most feared. So the point is, uh, uh, you know, Taekwondo, even it's in its simplicity, is not an art to be played with. It's a down and dirty art. Correct. You know, it's a battlefield art. It is, in the traditional sense. Because if we start looking at the sportification of it, then we talk, start talking about plucking stuff out that's dangerous, like throws and sweeps and high strikes and spear hands. You know, that, that, those things are all gone in a way. It, it's perfect because you brought me exactly to the question I was about to ask you about uh, the ROK soldiers in Vietnam being the most feared, would they have all been part of the Otakwan in the 60s when the Vietnam War was, was being fought? I would say for the most, I, that's a good question. I can't say definitively, but I would say yes. I would say yes, because you see, uh, the Chung De Quan was the largest Quan. Right? It had, Wong Kuk Lee at one point had supposedly 5,000 students. And I, I would love to have a fraction of that. <laughs> But the point is that uh, that was called the civilian one, right? Uh, General Che, when he started the Otakwan, that was considered the military one. So he, would, he drew off many instructors and also uh, students from the Chengdukwan when they came to the, when they came to to the, the mil service. The right, because it was compulsory. Yeah. compulsory right. oh, that's really interesting. So, <laughs> thank you, Master Laurie, for that question. We, you, we certainly went around that one. Um, <clears throat> coming back to the USTA, what, what do you see, and because nobody knows what's going to happen next week, next month, six months from now, or even next year. Nobody knows. What would you, as the head of the USTA, like to see happen? Well, first of all, I, like I told my wife last night, there's only two words that I definitely want to hear these days. And that is pure bound. <laughs> That's what I want to hear. <laughs> yes. Those two words. yes. Not just vaccine bound, but pure bound. bound. That might be a fairy tale right now, but I'm still a genie for that. I'm waiting. Uh, I believe it's going to happen. You know, the, the ultimate goal is to promote excellence in Taekwondo in the traditional sense and in the evolving sense, but not haphazardly, not just throwing away our tradition and accepting what the new 
strategies are, you know. So what I personally would like to see is our students uh, continue on the way we have been, focusing on forms as our central pillar, uh, and pulling out the essence of the forms as best we can, keeping our basic skills as strong as possible, uh, joining together with other USDA schools, you know, and uh, even furthering, uniting our techniques, you know, and gaining further knowledge from other instructors like we did with Master Tim Guiley from Finland, you know. Yes. So there's a great potential. The, 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 the good part, the good news is that sim the same way we're doing live streaming here, it isn't absolutely essential to be in one place with a group. We can do it in cyberspace remotely and still maintain this universe of ours together, but it's certainly going to make it more difficult, right? And not only that, Taekwondo is a people art. You know, we want to be close to each other. We right. want to feed off of each other's energy. No question. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, we can continue on with our march towards which is kind of an interesting way of looking at it. Usually look at tradition in the past, but a march forward into tradition in a much more kind environment, health-wise, in the future. That's what I really hope. It's a great goal. So we are pretty much out of time. Um, I do want to mention the fact that every good organization, such as the USTA, has a magazine a journal and and we have Hunlian did I pronounce that correctly? Hunlian, yeah. Hunlian. Hunlian means training or discipline that's what and that was uh, researched by our marketing vice president Hal Pike and there's the cover on the uh, screen right now you can see that's Grandmaster He Il Cho he's one of the mo he's a living legend one of the great living legends of Taekwondo right now uh, just to show you, he, was a, he is a movie star, he's been in there for many movies, but he was the head coach in The Best of the Best, that mm. first movie that's great. And uh, he's inspired thousands of martial artists worldwide, you know. And uh, we were honored beyond belief to have him uh, sit for an interview with his students. And uh, we're very excited about putting in. It's a high, high quality comes out twice a year, and the price reflects it, quite honestly. It's $19.95, price of an inexpensive bottle of good red wine, and uh, the wisdom you'll get from it, and you won't get a hangover either. <laughs> so uh, we highly recommend Hoonley Magazine. It'll be released on May 15th, and if you'd like a copy, you can email us um, at info at shosantke.com, and we'll arrange to have it sent to you. We're also working on it where you can pay online now on our website. Any day that will become active. And you can order it right through our website and we'll fulfill it and get it to you. So amongst that, there's many other great articles in there on meditation and, and cooking, Korean cooking, all sorts of things that have to do with Korea. So. Ocean Seoul. Mm -hmm. well, that's great. And you styled this after the journal for Asian... Yeah, like that's, a true, that's actually a true thing and I should still give some credit to that. Uh, for years, there was a journal called the Journal of the Asian Martial Arts. Yes. And it was the Scientific American of the Martial Arts. Sure Academy. was. I loved it. Uh, if you can, I think it's still possible to get it online. Oh. But as far as a printed entity, it went by the wayside several years ago. But uh, its publisher did a wonderful job on that magazine. It was a little uh, oriented towards the, the Chinese martial arts didn't have too much about Taekwondo in it. This is all about Taekwondo. That's one thing that I will pledge to you is that will be about, just like Totally Taekwondo by Master Stuart Angel, he kept his word about that. This is purely Taekwondo for you. Perfect. In all its styles, modern and traditional. Thank you so much, Kwan Jin. This, this was, My again, pleasure. another outstanding, really in-depth, under the covers understanding of our art. And, and I thank you so much for that. You're welcome. And please know that without Master Adams, this show would not exist. This was his idea. He put it forth when we started doing live stream classes. 
And I jumped at the opportunity, number one, because I love to talk and tell. But secondly, there is a lot of information, as he says, under the covers, under the yeah. hood of Taekwondo, and there's such a vast amount of knowledge, you can't describe it to him. Yes, that's correct. Thank you very much, sir. Thank and you, and sir. Thank, thank you all for watching, and hopefully you learned a whole bunch this evening, and uh, you'll tune in again next week. Please send me questions that I can ask Kwon Janim. Thank you so much. I appreciate your, your input and any suggestions you have for us. We'd love to hear it. Good night, everybody. Good night.